great to be here. The biblical backdrop for our series that we are in is the book of Judges. This book uh, serves primarily as a warning to us. It's not that inspirational, to be honest. The Israelites find themselves in a cycle of sin and then oppression, repentance, deliverance, peace, and round and round they go, back to sin, oppression, repentance, deliverance, peace. So they invite sin, and then sin naturally has uh, suffering that comes with it, and they want the suffering to stop, so they ask God to intervene and make the suffering stop. God does, and they go back to it. It is a sobering picture of the heart of man, the human condition without the Spirit of God. They knew the law. It wasn't enough. They knew what was righteous. It didn't help, just as it was for you and I, for those of us uh, who maybe encountered God uh, in our teenage years or later. We, we know what it is. We remember um, the state of our heart, the sort of existential aimlessness of life. And as a result of the state of my heart at that time, I can remember um, that I was just full of bad ideas. I, uh, I wasn't exactly sad, but I was a fool. I remember it pretty clearly. One such bad idea uh, that I had as a result of this boredom, of this state of my heart, uh, happened when I was in high school, and I figured out that uh, throwing an egg at a car uh, makes a really loud noise. That was really fun for me. And um, it doesn't cause damage to the vehicle, but it sounds like a shotgun. And so I kind of found meaning that week in my life through the egg throwing. And my friend Jordan and I, we conspired to throw these uh, protein blobs at passerbyers uh, on a local highway near my home. Remember, I was a fool. Okay, uh, so we're doing this, and it turns out to be way more fun than I thought. And uh, we're jumping out of the tall grass, and these drivers, they're driving alone at night. And um, they're probably having their life flash before their eyes, and... In a way, I, th I feel like I'm doing them a favor at that time. Like I I'm showing them what really matters. They're remembering what matters in life. And um, uh, one driver that we, that we really creamed with an egg, uh, it, I, re I remember, well, he's probably from Wisconsin. He, he, he was driving a truck, and he ended up uh, stealthily army crawling through the grass and then got the jump on us. And he... He had a knife, and he was very angry that we made this loud noise and scared him, and uh, that we got egg on his car. And so he held the knife up to my friend Jordan's throat, and remember, I'm a fool, so I go, dude, you're not going to kill us. Like, how can we make it right? Like, what can we do? So he gets more angry and holds the knife up to my throat, and... Uh, remember, this is what, like, existential boredom leads to. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then, get this, Jordan, my friend, he just books it when the, when the guy switches to me. And that was, well, okay, what ended up happening is I recognized the guy from gym class, which is really a weird coincidence. He was four years senior to me. And, uh, we ended up laughing and talking, and, and I washed the egg off his car or whatever. But question for you, You're, if you had a relationship with Jordan, at this point it's going to change, right? Like, <laughs> something critical happened in that moment. Uh, Jordan apologized, I think, later, and the, the, uh, but, but the level of betrayal, it warranted like a lasting change. It wasn't the same when we hung out. Uh, it created some distance. And um, you might not hate Jordan, you know, if you, if you were his friend at that point, but it's hard, it's hard to forget. Okay, last week, uh, Tommy brought us to Romans 7 and 8 to talk about the, the, the state of the heart of man and uh, that we are prone to wander. This week, I want to summarize uh, kind of what we learned from Romans chapter 7 and 8, but through, I want to I wanna summarize it through Galatians 5. Here it is, starting in verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let's pause there for a moment. 
Notice that, that language. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let it happen like you have a, a part to play in letting the Holy Spirit take governance. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful, sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit wants, gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. It says these fo- two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. In other words, no matter your intentions, no matter how good they are, if you're holding back from the Lord, you won't experience guidance by him. Uh, at this time, I'm going to have my daughter uh, some, uh, say what was just said already in this passage in Galatians 5 and then continue the rest of the passage. Go ahead. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses. When you, fo- when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, and um, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Um, let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this type of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Um, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature and to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. I figured she's easier to listen to me. Uh, Verse 24 again. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Last week, Tommy established that wherever God is leading your life, whatever his plans for you, uh, it begins with repentance from your sin, with the end to your rebellion against him. So our inner dialogue, our mantra that we sort of tell ourselves cannot be, yeah, one day, incremental repentance, one day at a time. The Bible uh, actually says, don't give your sin any time. It may sound harsh, but there is no biblical precedent for pacing your surrender to Christ. Because God's hope for you is freedom today. Hear that, Christians. Our posture must be never again, regardless of future temptation. And if you've never known uh, real surrender in Christ, like verse 24 describes, having nailed the passions and desires of your personal sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there, then what I want to say to you is not how dare you. It's not feel bad. It's just you're missing out. You can surrender. You can end your war against the God you love. You can let the Spirit guide your life. You can Love Jesus more than your sin. You can live within God's design. The transition from your design to his design, granted, can be really painful. Like, sometimes that's a definite um, process of pain that you have to go through. But what else are we going to do? Like, live in the in-between forever? What else are we going to do? Like, as we read, are are we going to live our lives constantly uh, with the two forces fighting so that you are not free to carry out our good intentions and then die? That's what most people do. That's boring. That's the wide road. That's a life filled with regret, no matter how small 
or mortal your repeated sin is, that life leads to where the book of Judges leads, which is this line over and over we see in the end of the book of Judges. This is where the cycle of sin eventually leads for the Israelites. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. This week, we find ourselves in Judges chapter 10. We're in the aftermath of two very unfamous judges, Tola and Jair. And um, they're, they're two judges in a long list of deliverers that God sent Israel. More famous judges, for instance, are like Gideon and Samson. Here in Judges 10, the header uh, in the translation I was going off of, uh, it says, further disobedience and oppression. So it's kind of another dark chapter here. Verse 6, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Bells and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, and the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. They forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against in Israel, and he sold them into the, hand of the hands of the Philistines and, did, and into the hands of the Ammonites, and they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was severely distressed. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians? And from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, and from the Philistines, the Sidians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand, yet you have forsaken me and served other gods, therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned, do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. It's a troubling passage. God does save the Israelites after they repented. But clearly the relationship is strained based on past interactions, past mistakes. And what I want to share to you today uh, I think is really good news for us. I've talked about this, uh, uh, I've touched on this at Mercy Hill before, and I think it's really important to revisit in the context of this series. But uh, as I dive into it, I, I just want to begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would open our hearts to your gospel message of mercy and hope, that you would destroy the lies of the enemy this morning as your word washes over us. May you wake us up in any way that we are asleep to you. May your word be alive and active in us. May it pierce us and judge the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Amen. We are prone to wander, so much so that sometimes the battle becomes uh, like, a, like a permanent loss, like a pattern of losing. Repentance, sin, repentance, sin, like the book of Judges, a cemented pattern of succumbing to temptation. Proverbs 26 says it like this, as a dog returns to its vomit, so fools repeat their folly. And the byproduct of this pendulum is a life and personality, not like the fruits of the Spirit that we read in Galatians 5, but instead, rather out of the cycle, we become bitter and isolated and filled with hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, and envy. Or for others of us, we begin to not become overly religious and isolated and bitter, but rather we, we identify more and more with our culture over time. Our values growing ever distant from the kingdom of Jesus. So we think on our lives, sometimes bi-weekly, uh, sometimes at church, once a week, and uh, we're not that impressed, and we're filled with this, uh, with this, with this yearning for change, and we know that a, a change is needed, 
and we, long, we read in Scripture that we can become a new creation in Christ and that the Spirit can guide our lives. And, and we hear maybe from a pastor or from Scripture, repent, reconcile with Christ, for he is God. The starting point is surrender. And yet for many of us, there is uh, an obstacle just standing in our way of all of that. And it's a lie, and it's, it's really common, and it's a critical misunderstanding that has lasting implications, and it's an understandable misunderstanding, and it's this. When we imagine God's forgiveness upon repentance for us, when we, th- when we think of that interaction, when we sort of spiritually cue ourselves, we're praying to God because of the privilege that we have to pray to the Father, through Jesus and the Spirit. When in our sin, when, when we go there, we imagine something about forgiveness and repentance like we give it, like we've received it before. I forgive you, but I trust you a little less. I mean... Would you invite my friend Jordan to be in a foxhole with you? (laughs) Would you trust him with anything? (laughs) In any kind of relationship? It's like, no, you bailed on me, man. I don't want you around. This is really just a big therapy session for me. (laughs) For Jordan. Uh, Some of you would tell poor old Jordan, I forgive you. But I never want to see you again, bro. Again, even if there's an apology, uh, there might be long-lasting negative effects on how you pal around and how your friendship is, understandably. And we feel and imagine something like Judges chapter 10 that we read when we think of conflict and reconciliation, repentance and forgiveness, even especially with God. I mean, how this passage of Scripture reads is like an interaction a parent would have, would have with their child. Let's say you have a kid, imagine it, and their ki- your kid is like 25 years old, let's just say in this hypothetical. If they sin against you in the same way, like 70 times, let's say, how much trust is going to remain? When they ask to be bailed out again from whatever situation, perhaps. The pattern of their past will affect your interaction with them when they say, I'm sorry, take me back. Even in reconciliation, the relationship becomes distressed, undeniably, right? Once again, this is Judges chapter 10, this is starting in verse 11 this time. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites? From the Ammonites and from the Philistines, the Sidians also, and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you. Then you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will, not, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. This is rough, right? But Christians, check it. What we see in Judges chapter 10, after the death of these two unfamous judges, Tola and Jair, and subsequent folly. This is a repentance in their in forgiveness that we see again and again in the book of Judges, having nothing to do with the blood of your Savior, nothing to do with the work of the cross. You see, the cross mattered in history. It wasn't, and then it was, and it changed everything. Think on the wonder of the cross with me, fellow believers, this morning. It's not a Judges 10 interaction with you and God. And this is really good news for us. Jesus broke the cycle that we see in the book of Judges. God sends deliverers to Israel throughout the book of Judges. But they don't bring a lasting deliverance. They had judges. They had belief. They had the law. But they did not have Christ. In Christ, we have a real lasting deliverance. A perfect judge the king of all kings. Romans 7. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Romans 8, therefore, now, no condemnation for those. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Amen? Y'all, the enemy hates this stuff just hates it. What our enemy who prowls like a beast seeking to devour you, what our enemy wants is for you to kind of not take this in. And instead, go on thinking about your potential repentance moment someday like a social human interaction, a kind of apology and forgiveness that we've given and received many times. The enemy wants you to downplay the work of Jesus Christ. He wants you to keep it human without Christ. And humans, we kind of forgive. I'm just being realistic here. We try not to be too mad at each other, is the the common kind of forgiveness. But man, we remember, and we love to crucify each other and gossip. We enjoy the advertising and the reading about the folly and downfall of our celebrities and leaders of government. It's big business at the checkout line. It's still in 2021. I mean, cancel culture is exaggerated, sure, right now, but, you know, like digging up all the tweets and stuff. But it's not new. What do you think they did to Jesus? They didn't like what he was saying, so they conspired to cancel him socially. And when that didn't work, they went through the government to silence and kill him. And what do you think the end game of our enemy is? For you. For you to despair. To cancel yourself within your own mind and spirit to see yourself as despicable and to prevent repentance therein to punish yourself as you identify with your sin to think of your past rebellion as who you are which again is the caveat most human reconciliation carries with it you're repenting sure but i know you who are you to repent who are you to receive forgiveness do you know what satan means in hebrew Accuser. You stand accused, brethren, that you are your sin, that your life should end with destruction, not grace. You don't want it to end in destruction, but maybe part of the lie is somewhere you think you deserve that destruction. So what happens, oddly enough, is that sin and resulting shame leads us right back into it. Back to the pig pen, back to the cycle of judges. So even if we know our sin never works, even if we know it's destructive, the avalanche of sin and shame and guilt and such repetitive folly leads to what? Back into sin, leaving us with no real vision forward, just folly and regret. But you know what? Those are lies from the father of lies. And it's Sunday, and we're at church, and we are followers of Jesus Christ. And I want to talk about Jesus right now, and his way, and the new covenant. Christians, through Christ, because of Christ, God's love for you is patient. It keeps no record of wrongs. It always hopes for you, it always perseveres for you, and for your, reconcilia- for your reconciliation with Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, his forgiveness isn't a social human forgiveness. It's unlike any other. So, bring your earnest repentance, you can bring your earnest repentance to the perfect judge. It's not like human forgiveness. It's not like the forgiveness your parents gave you or you gave them. It's not like your spouse 
or your kids or your siblings or anyone. It's ancient and it costs uh, way more than you can imagine. It's blood, it's the cross, it's obliterating forgiveness, it's mystery. Jesus says we can eat it and drink it, we can consume it, it's ours, we can have it. Regardless of your remorse and disgust and distrust for yourself, when you, in sincerity, repent and cry out and ask God for forgiveness in light of Jesus, not you, you are covered in the perfection, in the, the righteousness imputed to you by Jesus. That's what God sees, not distrust. God is not holding you at an arm's length in distrust. God has chosen this way for us, for you. So receive your communion with God. It is, it is to remember divine forgiveness that you have in Jesus. It is atoning upon your repentance. It is covenantal. So wherever you're at, whatever you lost, whatever you did, however long you took, the blood of Jesus is such that you can regain all that was lost. And that is really good news for us. Because that is not the math that we do in our head. That is not the scales that we hold against ourselves. First John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Acts 2 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you are here, it's important to know in the context of this series about repentance, uh, it's important to be challenged to not let your shame diminish the cross any longer. Let there be no obstacle this morning in your repentance for Jesus. James 4 says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Concerning that enemy, concerning the accuser, I have more good news because of Jesus. We can impart, embrace that we are prone to wander. But instead of hiding in a cycle of like sin and shame, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. No other worldview makes this kind of declaration. Come to me, you worn out, tired old sinners. I'll take you in. With our confession of sin, with our repentance, and with posture, that says, never again, Spirit, lead me. Upon receiving God's forgiveness, the enemy has no power over us. So the accuser wants you to identify with your sin so strongly with your past that you believe that's what you are. Okay, try this. So if that's you and that's kind of where you've been living for a while, just try this. Okay, I'm a sinner saved by grace. That's the privilege that we get from the gospel, from the good news. I am a sinner saved by grace. You have no power over me, over me, ancient serpent. I stomp on your head with a single blow because Jesus has washed my sin away. And he did that, not me. And my deepest, darkest past becomes not my shame, but my testimony of grace. That which I've been saved from. That which God has delivered me from. Embrace the accusations made against you. There, the accuser has no ammunition because we can agree with him. Revelation chapter 12 says this, And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers, the accuser of the brethren, has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Uh, we set out communion here in the front. We're going to take this, these elements, this communion, in just a moment. His body broken, his blood shed. And uh, some of us will, will take this communion in remembrance for all that God has delivered you from, delivered us from. And some of us uh, will take this communion in light of really specific, important repentance that you have to do today. If that's you, that, that you're feeling like you're, you're in need of a repentance and you're in need of, uh, of uh, telling God that you surrender a, a very specific repetitive area of your life. If that's you today, 
know this, no matter how uh, the math works out for you, no matter the beans on the scale, I am more convinced of this than ever, that our God who is perfect love is just waiting for you, just wanting to be in relationship with you. And he isn't, he isn't thinking like, man, it's taken you a long time. He isn't thinking you could, you could have done it better. Our God, whatever it takes, wants to be in right relationship with you. But, there, but you have to do it on his terms. You have to do it in surrender to our Lord, Jesus Christ. His mercies are new right now and every morning. Acts 3. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Let us stand together at this time. And as we take communion during the music, whenever you feel led to, to come, whenever you're ready to, to come and take the elements, I encourage you um, also to do what is prescribed in Scripture. The prayer partners can come up at this time. They'll be on kind of the wings of the stage here and here. And what you can do is you can take communion, and then you can, you can do what, what Scripture prescribes. You can receive prayer from another believer, and, uh, and, and there's power in prayer. You, you can, you can uh, have like a, a confession and, and a conversation if you want and receive prayer in the context of that, in light of that, or you can just receive prayer and spiritual blessing at, without any conversation. Just be like, just pray for me. And if they're busy with other people, then you can uh, loop back. Jaren, do we, only, do we just have you only today? All right, anybody else game to pray with other believers? Raise your hand. All right, cool. Why don't you guys go to the sides of the stage? And we got a lot of people who are game to pray um, here. This is, this is um, something repeated over and over and over in the New Testament. Not only um, repent, and that's the starting point of your relationship with God. Like, I just have to go on a little tangent here really quick. So I have noticed as 15 years as a pastor in America that, that there is a culture from the pulpit to the congregation. There's a culture created of acceptance of sin. And um, I feel that, and, I'm, and, I, and maybe this is me being like a mean old curmudgeon already at only 37 years old, but I, I feel like we are creating a culture of acceptance of sin. Whereas scripture is saying, that's the milk, that's the starting point. Like, there's so much after you repent from your sin, there's so much after you give it up to the Lord and stop your sin. Then it's like, how to process your mission in the Lord. How to like, do your life with God, not in rebellion to Him. I just felt like I should go on that tangent. So we're gonna come and we're going to... Uh, we're going to celebrate what God, the work of the cross. We're going to remember what Jesus has done for us. We're going to repent from our sin. And then, as I said, for, for, if there's a prayer partner free, um, go to them and, and pray with them and receive prayer. And you can, it doesn't even have to be a conversation. Just have them pray over you.